So that's it. That's all we're going to talk about in terms of the tensile strength of rocks. We'll just introduce hydraulic fracturing to you. We'll come back to hydraulic fracturing in more detail at the end of the class. So now that we know a, a lot about this more Coulomb stuff, we can go back to slip-on faults. So remember, when we talked about slip-on faults, I just gave you this equation. And if you remember, in one of your homework assignments, I asked you to just randomly choose a bunch of plots and, and see what happens, you know? And I think now you, you, see, you look back and you see that all of them fell within the sort of valid stress values associated with more surface, right? If you remember that, that plot you generated. Um, and so this is nothing more than a more, failure, more Coulomb failure criteria for a material that has no cohesion, as S0 is zero, zero, right? It's the same exact model. It's just a, now that failure line crosses through, there's no y-intercept, it crosses through. Well, it's y y-intercept, but it's zero. And so w given that, we can come up with some bounds on the stresses in the Earth associated with faulting. And the idea that there's a critically stressed crust, okay? So this is, a, this is an idea that the Earth, you have this very sort of, compared to the diameter or radius of the Earth, you have this very thin crust, okay? And underneath the crust is the mantle, but the, 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 the uppermost part of the mantle and the crust is what makes up the lithosphere, the part of the Earth that moves around due to tectonic motion, okay? And the tectonic motion, for, for the most part, we can consider it's slow enough that the, the Earth is in equilibrium. So if I take any large enough section of the Earth and I cut it out and I draw the forces on it, they're going to be sort of equal and opposite on all sides. Right? It's for the most part going to be in equilibrium. All right. However, so I, so I have these sort of equal and opposite forces interacting on my cross section of Earth here. Okay. But the mantle there is a viscoelastic material. It creeps. Right. We talked about creep. So if I apply the same forces over, I mean, if I apply the same forces over time, I'm going to get continued strain <laughs> in that region, right? And so if you look at the arrows here and you imagine that those represent vectors that fly the same forces, eventually, over some time, the mantle, the lithosphere that's connected to the part of the crust is going to creep. It's going to continue to strain. And the only way that the crust can accommodate that motion is to fault, has to fracture. Right? So that's the only possible way. So the idea here is that the crust of the Earth is in a, basically a state of continued incipient failure associated with this sort of idea, this critically stressed crust idea. So there's always faulting and failing due to this. Okay. And the stress in the Earth backs up this sort of idea. So Here's a plot of many, many stress measurements that were done at different, these are fairly deep wells. And this is a, basically the more failure line. Uh, and you see that they basically stack up on this 0 0.6, which I remember I told you, if you don't know better, any better, friction is always 0 0.6, right? So they, they f for the most part, stack up on this. Now, I mean, the crosses are the error, error bars, so they're not, it's not perfect. But for the most part, they, f they stack up on this uh, 0 0.6 line and seem to seem to indicate that you know a vast majority of the Earth is is bound by this sort of idea that faults are going to slip at some criti critical stress. Okay, and so then with that we can come up with some limits on the tissue stress from this idea. So if you have part of the Earth right and these these here are just idealized fractures that are randomly distributed. Only some of those are going to be oriented in such a way that they're going to accommodate slip. For example, if I have a fracture that's perfectly, perfectly normal to S1, it's just never going to slip, right? It's, just, it's never going to slip, no matter what I do. Uh, but, but many of them that are sort of uh, are oriented in such a way that they accommodate slip, and we can determine you know, basically now, returning to our more Coulomb diagram, where you know here is our more failure envelope. Failure envelope, just in this case, means sliding. It's already a fault there. S zero passes through zero. Uh, 
and then what we know about the angle, the geometry, and two beta, and we can relate that to uh, we can re relate that to this guy, which then if you maximize it tells us that optimally when beta is like 60 degrees, this, this is the optimal angle of the fault to the slider. Okay. And so then we can basically use our more coulomb diagram to come up with a stress ratio. So in other words, if we just divide s uh, sigma 1 by sigma 3 or if we you know in terms of the poor in terms of the actual stress and the pore pressure. So I think I've been trying to be consistent that anytime I use a sigma I'm talking about an effective stress and anytime I use an s I'm talking about the in situ stress in the earth. So the, the effective stress is the in situ stress minus the pore pressure. So then using our more failure criteria now, we can come up with this equation. And if you plug in a value of mu equal to 0 0.6, you can see that the maximum ratio of the stresses in the Earth, according to this idea, remember, according to this idea that any large enough section of the Earth is going to have enough faults in it that some of them are going to be constantly activated and slipping. Okay? So we have to bound the stress based on the fact that these faults are going to slip, right? then the maximum stress difference we can have is about 3.1. And so we can, this can be useful for bounding the stress, or in terms of, you know, if, if say, at, you know, say uh, SV is the vertical stress, we're in, in a normal faulting regime, SV is the normal stress, okay, then even, if, even without going to the field and doing any measurements, we can at least get a maximum upper bound, according to this theory, on what the minimum horizontal stress would be, right? Without doing a single measurement, because we can, we can estimate the vertical stress just via the overburden, right? And of course, we'd have to have some idea of the pore pressure, but we could also estimate it as hydrostatic if we need to. And so then we could compute, according to those estimations, what sigma 1 is, and then if we just you know, just say divide that by 3.1, that should give us the maximum bound according to this theory of what SH min could be. Right? And so that's sort of what's done here for different faulting regimes. So this is for normal faulting, strike slip faulting, reverse faulting. Of course, in strike slip faulting, you know, the vertical stress isn't in there. So in other words, if I look at this equation, the only unknown is SH min, right? Or the only, the only thing it's hard to get. Right? I mean, truly, these are unknown, too, but I can come up with fairly good guesses of those, or estimations. SH min, I can't, if I don't have any bound on it, I can't guess what it is. I have to go do a leak-off test, a mini-frag, something like that, right? But in the absence of doing that, I can get a bound on what the maximum is associated with this theory by just solving that equation for SH min and plugging in the values. Uh, so that works quite well for no normal and reverse faulting, where the only unknowns are the horizontal stresses. But in, this, in a strike-slip regime, now you, know, you have to know one of those. So you basically have to go do some type of test, and we'll talk about what types of tests you could do in that scenario. Um, so this is the last slide for today. And this we, we already talked about this in terms of how um, mud weight can affect wellbore stability, but this is sort of the same idea in that now, you know, and, and, and we, you knew this, we, we've done some calculations with this, this is just now the Mohr diagram that explains why, right? So now you have the Mohr circles, and if I increase the pore pressure, I move this, I shrink the circles. So if I increase the pore pressure, I move the circles that way, and what that tells you is that, you know, even for a fairly low stress difference, which would be in this regime down here. It's a very small stress difference in terms of the normal to shear stresses could be very small, but if the pore pressure is high enough, I can still get slip. Right. So we'll end there today.